Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Today, we finally study the last chapter of the book of Acts, chapter 28. And I hope you've all enjoyed this study as much as I have. But more importantly, I pray that this study has been edifying for you. Meaning, I pray this study has opened your eyes to right division and dispensation and what it truly is. Now, for those of you who have been studying along with me from chapter 1 all the way to the end, you should understand at this point why the book of Acts is called a transitional book. So, if and when someone asks you, why is the book of Acts called a transitional book, you should be able to answer them. The book of Acts shows the transition from Israel's kingdom gospel over to Paul's mystery gospel, from faith plus law to faith alone, without the law. Now, we left off in our last study, Paul and crew are aboard a ship filled with grain from Egypt. The ship crashes into a sandbar and begins to fall apart, so everybody has to bail ship. Julius, the centurion, and his soldiers and the prisoners are told to get ashore, some swimming, others floating on boards and debris coming from the ship. They all make it to shore. Not one of them perishes, as promised by the angel of God, who told Paul that not one person would die, just as long as they stayed with the Apostle Paul. The island they managed to find safety on is called Melita, also known as Malta. So we're starting out at the end of the year, 59 AD, somewhere around October, and chapter 28 will cover several years, from 59 AD all the way to 65 AD, and in 60, 61 AD, Paul is going to write his four prison epistles in Rome. These books are Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Also, after Paul's release from his first Roman imprisonment in 62 AD, he's going to write his last three letters. First, he's going to write the letter to Timothy, then a letter to Titus, then he's going to write again to Timothy, which we know is 2 Timothy, somewhere around the year 64 to 66 AD. Paul's life will end by martyrdom during his second Roman imprisonment in 66 AD, just four years before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, some interesting facts that take place from 66 to 70 AD. Josephus surrenders to Rome. Nero will commit suicide. Vespian prevails as the emperor amidst a civil war and of course in 70 AD we're going to have the destruction of the temple under Titus. Now if you'd like to see the entire timeline of the book of Acts here's the address. I'm going to put it on the screen. It's on the uh, Blue Letter Bible website and this is the entire life of Paul. It's very interesting. And of course, these dates are not in stone, okay? But we have a general sense of the period of time of our Apostle Paul's ministry. So let's begin our final study in the book of Acts, chapter 28, in the King James Version Bible, always, in verse 1. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, also Malta. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And remember, this is winter. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on a fire, there came a viper, a snake, out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Now, the island, of course, is Malta or Melita, is about 500 miles from Fair Havens. If you remember Fair Havens in our last study, and after swimming to shore, they meet the island people, the, barbar the barbarous people, which, according to Luke, were not inferior towards Paul and the rest of the crew, but were very friendly and provided much relief. Now, one incident that Luke records is when Paul gets bit by a poisonous snake which was coiled up in a bundle of firewood that Paul picked up to throw in the fire that they were building. And this type of snake, obviously being native to that island, was known by the islanders to be very poisonous. And getting bit by this species of snake meant death. Death would come soon for that victim. However, 
after getting bit by this poisonous snake, this viper, nothing happens to Paul. Now, remember, Jesus told Paul that he would stand in Rome to testify before all men. And when our Lord Jesus says something is going to be done, the gates of hell can't stop it. Amen? So Paul lives. And because nothing happens to Paul, he doesn't get sick or he doesn't die. The islanders think this is supernatural and call Paul a god. They believe that the only way Paul could have survived the snake bite is if Paul was beyond human. At first, the islanders thought that the snake biting Paul was justice because he was a prisoner and that was just God's way of getting even with Paul. But we know what happens. In verse 5, And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen and fallen down dead suddenly. But after, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Paul gets bit. Nothing happens to him. And instead of giving God the glory, these people give Paul the glory, thinking Paul was a god himself. Indeed, a miracle had taken place. No doubt about that. But it wasn't by Paul's own power. This miracle was done by Christ Jesus alone. In verse 7, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux. He was coughing up blood. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Now, it was too dangerous to travel by sea during the winter months, so Paul and crew waited out, staying on Malta, for three months probably leaving in late January early February they begin their journey heading north about 80 miles to Sicily most likely they once again boarded a ship carrying grain from Egypt now notice in verse 11 it says the sign of Castor and Pollux well Castor and Pollux were part of Greek mythology supposedly Castor and Pollux were twins and these twins were thought to protect sailors now, this is all based on Greek superstition. In verse 12, And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence, we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petulia, Petuli, where we found brethren, and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Abbey Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So Paul finally makes it to Rome. Julius tells the Roman officials there in Rome that Paul is a good man and not the type of person that would try to escape. And keep in mind that Paul was a Roman citizen too and this was to his benefit and no doubt one of the considerations at the time. So Roman officials don't put Paul locked up behind bars in some dungeon. Instead they allow Paul to live alone, what we, we call today house arrest. But they assign one soldier, a parole officer if you will, to keep an eye on Paul while waiting for trial. In verse 17, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of, for this cause there, therefore I have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So we see Paul follow his usual custom, finding the synagogues and speaking to the Jews. Paul basically tells them three things. And keep in mind, 
that Gentiles also attended the synagogues and they too heard what Paul had to say about the body of Christ, about Jesus being the Jews Messiah and so on. The three things that Paul talks about, first, he says he did nothing against his brethren, the Jews. Second, Paul tells them that the officials back in Caesarea found nothing against him and would have set him free. Third, Paul reveals to them that the Jews refused to find Paul innocent. And because of that, Paul had no choice but to appeal to the Roman emperor. His hands were tied, if you will. Paul tells them that he's a prisoner for believing that they believe about uh, what they believe about the Jewish Messiah. Verse 21. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. And the reason why they didn't receive any letters or information regarding Paul is because, remember, this is winter time. And they, uh, they generally didn't tr get letters or they didn't travel by ship during the winter. So no letters or very few found their way from Jerusalem to Rome. So they knew nothing concerning Paul's trial in Caesarea. However, that doesn't mean that they had no knowledge of the gospel. Remember that Paul wrote the book of Romans just prior to all the commotion back in Jerusalem and Caesarea prior to Paul's arrest. So Paul's letter called Romans, what we know as Romans, had no doubt made it to Rome just prior to Paul's arrival. Paul wrote the book of Romans back in 56 AD, about four years earlier, and the letter had plenty of time to get there. In verse 22, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest for us concerning this sect. We know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. So, as Paul usually did, he reasons with the Jews, proving to them from scriptures that Jesus is in fact the Messiah that the prophets spoke about. And we know that once Paul proved this part, that part to them, and they believed that part, He'd move on to explain the meaning and purpose of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. And if they sincerely believed that gospel, they were added to the body of Christ. Whether they were Jews or Gentiles, it didn't matter. In verse 24, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Hallelujah! And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well, spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing, ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing, ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now Paul, frustrated of their disbelief, quotes the book of Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah 6, verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their eyes heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Speaking of Daniel 7-8 week here. And the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Now I want to share something with you in verse 12. It says, And there be a great forsaking. Remember that word? We talked about that word. In the midst of the land. If you recall our previous studies in the word forsake, or apostasia, back in Acts 21.21, 21, also in 2 Thessalonians 2, the word forsake in those verses mean a spiritual falling away, to reject the faith. The meaning of the word here in Isaiah 6.12, a great forsaking, is a physical falling away. The word here is not apostasia, but the word is azuva. When all the people will leave the land, 
the, it, the land would become desolate. The word azuva is used. When all the people leave their faith, however, the word apostasia is used. And when people are removed quickly and by force, by an outside force, the word used is harpazo, the rapture. Okay, moving on. Now, question. Did Paul only go to the Gentiles here in Acts 28? Of course not. We know from our study that Paul had been preaching to the Gentiles since day one. All the way back in Acts 9, 13, in mid-Acts, if you will. That's where the phrase mid-Acts dispensationalist comes from. And we know Paul spent 10 years in his early ministry living in Tarsus, Roman Gentile territory, which is, of course, filled with Gentiles for 10 years. I'm sure Paul didn't seclude himself in, tar in a Tarsus home and speak to no one for those 10 years. Of course, he preached to Gentiles during that time, all the way back starting in mid-Acts. In verse 29, And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. He rented a house and received all that came in unto him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now we know Paul wrote what we call his prison letters or epistles during this time. Philemon, Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And after Paul's trial, he's set free once again. He's given liberty. He continues to preach the gospel of grace, the gospel of grace of God. And he wrote his last three letters, Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, completing our written gospel for today. In conclusion, we've seen that the book of Acts, recorded through Luke, written by the Holy Spirit, is a record of Paul's ministry from 34 AD on the road to Damascus all the way to 66 AD at Paul's death. During this time, Paul wrote 13 books, our books for today, all about the body of Christ. Paul struggled with convincing the Jews from the Old Testament scriptures, proving to them that the prophets spoke about Jesus. Also struggling to convince both the Jews and Gentiles that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again from the grave, paying for our sins once and for all, providing the free gift of eternal life. Notice how, how Paul's struggle wasn't with the Gentiles, but with the Jews. His struggle was about trying to convince the Jews that keeping the law fell short of eternal salvation, and only faith in Christ Jesus could save them. Paul's struggle was with the Mosaic system, the law, the kingdom program, and we know that the Jews were punished for rejecting their Messiah. And part of this punishment was that they were made partially blind until the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. And this battle of law versus grace continues even today we see people stuck in the kingdom program all over the world even professing christians and once the rapture takes place the mosaic system will become dominant once again the return of the kingdom program will commence during daniel's 70th week and once again the jews besides the elect remnant will have to turn to jesus christ to be saved enduring till the end and finally, calling on the name of the Lord to save them. Read Joel 2, verses 28 to 32. Very important. That's a very important verse. Joel 2, 28 to 32. Daniel's 70th week is all about faith plus the law. Once again, works producing fruit. The oil in the parable of the virgins. Okay, Saints and friends, my hope is that this study has been a blessing to you. I pray that you've been edified, and I pray that you're going to continue to study. Our time is almost up here. And most importantly, if you're unsure if you're saved or not, if you're unsure what's going to happen to you when you die, I pray you'll take measures to make sure that your soul will be claimed by Christ Jesus when your time comes. Life is very short. Material things won't help you. I've seen a lot of things in my life but one thing I've never seen and most assuredly will never see is a U-Haul behind a hearse. The only reason we're here on this earth, friends, is to know Christ Jesus as Savior. That's the answer to life. If you've ever asked the question or heard someone ask the question, what is the meaning to life? 
It is to know Christ Jesus as Savior and to let our Lord God use us as instruments in his hands to bring him glory and praise. Oh, and one other important fact is for those of you who, again, are not saved, if you want to know how it's going to be after the rapture, if you're wondering what it's going to be like after the body of Christ is taken up and once the restrainer is gone, if you want a good idea of what the world is going to be like, read and study the four Gospels, the first seven chapters of Acts, Hebrews through Revelation, plus add to that the Antichrist, fallen angels, wars, famines, earthquakes, disease, deception, slavery, and you'll get a good glimpse of what the seven-year tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, is going to be like. It's not going to be pretty. And you don't want to be here for what's coming very soon. Very, very, very soon. God have mercy on you and your souls. I love you all. And to Christ Jesus be all the glory always and forever. And I'll see you on the next study, Lord willing.